only remedy there is to generate more data. We need more data to bring those confidence intervals to, to a more narrow point. And that's the importance of continuing with the phase three trials in Latin America in five countries and in Asia Pacific in five countries. With that, we'll have a higher level of confidence. We are going to try to understand what we can do, of course, to make this a, a vaccine that works against all four serotypes, right? There, we noted that there was a mutation, a significant mutation in the envelope in domain two um, uh, in Ratchaburi at the time of the study. And so this would have an impact on the vaccine because the vaccine, of course, has antibodies measured and tailored to the, the capsule. And so is that a reason? We are not completely sure at this time, but it's certainly a possibility. Could this be a population effect? Of course, these are Thai children. Thai children are not necessarily the same as Vietnamese children or Filipino children or, or any others. They have, for one reason, uh, a different nutritional status. They have their own genetic makeup and they have Japanese encephalitis vaccination in their schedule. JE vaccination has been, uh, in the past, deemed something positive because if you vaccinate with dengue afterwards, the antibodies go, go higher. But there is also a publication that incriminates JE and says that the risk for severe complications seems a bit higher after JE vaccination. I do not know how much uh, ground there is to give to that. We are pro-vaccinologists, we are not anti-vaccinologists. But finding these results, of course, we want to turn over every stone we can to understand what we have. And so we need also more data from countries with JE and without JE vaccines and compare. And that again will come from the following uh, trials. We did get an editorial. The studies were published in The Lancet um, in September. So this, this is available online. And again, we'll be happy to share that with you if there is interest. So the full trial has been described. And there was an auditor uh, editorial by Scott Halstead who is a very well-known figure in terms of uh, dengue research. And so if you go through his um, editorial, it is actually a good mixed review. It talks about the challenges. He's devoted his career to that. And I think he feels a little bit sad that we're not completely there yet. At the same time, you can also see at the title a 75% solution question mark, and that's also very much his view. We, we, we have uh, accomplished something of major significance. Having efficacy against three serotypes is new and is the first time. This is the first efficacy trial, and three of, out of four is not that bad. Of course, we were dreaming of four, and we will try to get to four. The question that is open is, what about that two? Will that get worse? If that does not get worse, then you have a three-quarter solution, effectively. If it does get worse, that's a very different ballgame, of course. We have no evidence from any of the data we have looked at at this point in time that the severity with dengue 2 in vaccinees or non-vaccinees is in any shape or manner worse. So this is very reassuring. But the same um, uh, comment goes that we need to build up our data in a more robust manner to reassure the full scientific community that this is a, a valid approach. And I think this is just a recap of what I've stated. Um, the safety profile of this vaccine is good. This is the first time that a dengue vaccine efficacy trial was done. It shows efficacy proof of concept against three out of four with um, uh, good numbers. We need to look at what can be done about dengue serotype two and what the impact is. Those results will come from large ongoing efficacy trials and the results will come in 2014. For any large uh, developments, there's always a large number of people to thank and I don't wanna waste too much time because this is uh, for internal people as well as our external collaborators, our vast network of investigators, and of course all the families and children who participate in the trials. I don't manage even to get the slide up. And here you find that. And I want to thank you for your attention. I'm not sure if the organizers allow any time for questions. I know we're a little bit over time. Maybe we can have one or two questions. Are there any questions? Pamela Tika Hulao. I am an adult infectious disease specialist at Baguio General Hospital and I was tasked to give a brief introduction of our, of our facilitator. 
um, our facilitator, moderator this afternoon, is a pediatric infectious disease specialist who is an active consultant of the infectious disease section at PCMC. She's also an active consultant at the Victor R. Potenciano Memorial Center. She's a mem an adjunct faculty of the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health and is a member of the editorial board of the PIDSPI Journal. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Fatima Ignacio Jimenez. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Thea. Okay, I was warned by the by Liz Gallardo that this is supposed to be a jam-packed room. Okay, so I'm sure that a lot of people went to take a wee-wee break. So I'd like to believe that we are jam-packed. Now, if we are not, since this is supposed to be a session wherein it has been labeled, or this session has been laid to be an interactive one, after the lecture, then I would love to encourage everybody to uh, come forward and fill the empty seats. Okay, so I am going to um, introduce, with your permission, the speakers and the reactors for this afternoon. First of all, we have Dr. Alexei Marrero. He's with the Department of Health and Center for Health Development of the Cordillera Administrative Region. He took his Bachelor of Science in Medical Technology at the St. Louis University, his Doctor of Medicine at the Virgen Milagrosa University Foundation, San Carlos City, Pagasinan, was the medical officer of Bontoc General Hospital from the period of 2001 to 2002. And uh, I take my hat off to you. He was doctor to the Barrios from 2002 to 2004. From 2004 to 2007, he served as the municipal health officer of the Sabangan or in Sabangan Mountain Province and presently is the medical officer for the Center for Health Development Cordillera Administrative Region. He's presently handling or has handled three programs one is the EPI, or the Expanded Program on Immunization. The second is the Malaria Control Program. And third, we just have heard that there is a vaccine in the horizon. He has also handled the Dengue Prevention and Control Program. One of our reactors for today is also with the Baguio Health Department. She is Mrs. Purificacion Sahoy Serna. She was a graduate, or she is a graduate of the Baguio General Hospital back in 76. Uh, she took her master's degree in the management, in management rather, at the UP in Baguio City and is currently nurse, how would I say that, nurse five, fifth level in the Baguio Health Department. And I'd like to tell everyone that she has been a public health nurse for the last 35 years. Presently, she's also an EPI coordinator. Our last reactor is Dr. Maria Imelda Ulep, who's with the Provincial Health Office. Likewise, she is a registered nurse, okay, took her Master of Hospital Administration, is a certified family physician, is a diplomate of the Philippine College of Occupational Medicine, and is career service executive eligible. She has held a lot of uh, positions. Presently, she's the head coordinator of the Provincial Epidemiology and Surveillance Unit and Health Emergency Management System. What a mouthful. Okay, so before I call upon the two reactors, may I call on Dr. Alexei Marrero. Dr. Marrero, okay, everyone's giving you uh, too much encouragement. He asked me to ask the two reactors to come up on stage so that you can feast your eyes on the two women. The may women would like to feast their eyes on you, Dr. Marrero. So here to present updates on the implementation of the EPI program, let's all give a big hand to Dr. Marrero. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Parang walang tao dito sa symposium na to. Good afternoon. 
Okay, sila lang. <laughs> okay, I will be presenting to you uh, the policies for the expanded program on immunization and uh, some of the EPI, EPI updates. So, okay, next please. I uh, will go back a little bit. So the history of EPI, it started in July 1976. Uh, this was with the help of the World Health Organization and the UNICEF. Next, please. Uh, the legal basis for the program, the expanded program on immunization, is provided for in Presidential Decree 996, which was signed in 1976 by then President uh, Marcos. Uh, with the title providing for compulsory basic immunization for infants and children. Another legislation was the uh, Republic Act 7846, which was enacted in 1994. This provided for the compulsory hepatitis B immunization among infants and children less than 8 years old. Uh, contained in these two legislation is, of course, uh, first the uh, young... Uh, while po. Ay yung title nandun nga po, compulsory. So lahat ng mga children supposedly should be vaccinated. And secondly, these uh, immunization services should be given for free. And uh, if these vaccines are given or are sold, uh, this is punishable by law. Next po. Another law is the Republic Act 10152. This is the most recent uh, legislation signed last year, 2011, by President uh, Aquino. This called for the mandatory infants and children. I mean, it is entitled Mandatory Infants and Children Health Immunization Act of 2011. In this uh, legislation, this included the provisions for immunization against uh, mumps, rubella, and the hemophilus influenza B vaccines. Next. Uh, our major policy in the expanded program on immunization is the uh, administrative order number 39 series of 2003, which was signed by uh, then Secretary Manuel Dairit. Uh, entitled Policies on the Nationwide Implementation of the Expanded Program on Immunization. In this document, uh, you have the prescription for the general guidelines in the implementation of the program. Also contained in this uh, document is the policy, uh, policy statement of the program, which goes like this. Immunization is a basic right of the child, and therefore, no child shall be deprived of it. As it is, the nation regards children as one of its most important uh, assets. And the all efforts should be made to ensure that their development uh, will be, the, the development of their, they will, be, they, they will develop their full potential. So one of the problems that we encounter in the implementation of our program is when mothers refuse vaccination. Uh, we always say that the right of the child to be immunized comes before the right of the mother to uh, refuse. Next one. Uh, the goal of the program is the reduction of child morbidity and mortality against vaccine-preventable diseases through attaining at least 95% and maintaining 95% full immunized child coverage all over the country. Next, please. I will go to the national coverage of the program. Uh, this is 2010 and 2011. For BCG, uh, we went up 86% in 2010 and 88% in 2011. OPV 1, 2, and 3, it went up also. 86 to 89, 84 to 87, 83 to 84 percent. DPT 1, 2, and 3 also went up. 86 percent to 88 percent. 
85% to 86%, DPT-3, 83% to 84%. Uh, we give the hepatitis, hepatitis B birth dose, uh, but uh, it's not fully implemented in all the hospitals and all the deliveries do not, uh, uh, are not being immunized by, are not being given hepatitis B uh, within 24 hours. Our coverage in, nine, in 2010 is 38%. And in 2011, is only 42%. So we have a long way to go in improving these coverages. More than 24 hours, hepatitis B, 55%, went down to 48%. For hepatitis B2, it remained the same, 81% coverage for 2010 and 2011. Hepatitis B3, it went down, 82% to 80%. Anti-measles virus, anti-measles vaccine, 85 percent went down to 84 percent, and we recently introduced the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. Uh, that's why our coverage is very low, 19 percent and uh, 31 percent only for last year. Our fully immunized child coverage for 2010 is 84 percent, went down to 82 percent in. 2011. Uh, fully immunized child means uh, the child before reaching one year old uh, gets one dose of BCG, three doses of OPV, three doses of DPT, uh, three doses of Hep B, one dose of anti measles vaccine. Next, please. Uh, this is the five year national FIC coverage. As you can see, it is going down. Next, please. Uh, okay, MDG. Uh, the Philippines is one of several countries which uh, committed to the attainment of the Millennium Development Goals by 2015. And uh, immunization is linked to MDG number four, which is the reduction of child mortality. Uh, these are the indicators. Uh, indicator number one, proportion of, of FIC. We had a baseline of 80% in to the year 2000. Our goal is 95%. Our current status is 82%. Under five mortality, baseline in 1990 is 80 per 100,000 live births. Our goal is 26.7. Our current status is 40. Infant mortality, 57 per 100,000 live births in 1990. Our goal is 19, and our current status is 29. So we should, have, we should attain these goals by 2015. Uh, we have three years more to go. Okay. Next, please. Okay. Uh, last year, we conducted the uh, measles rubella supplemental immunization activity uh, because of uh, uh, measles outbreaks to, uh, in, in many parts of the country. These are our accomplishments last year. So we provided measles and rubella, vir uh, rubella vaccine to children less than eight years old. So the total coverage for the whole country is 84%. We were able to vaccinate 15,649,907 children. For CAR, our region, uh, we had an 82% coverage. Next, please. Uh, but the effect of the campaign in CAR is uh, very dramatic, I would think so. Because in 2010, we had 86 uh, laboratory confirmed measles cases. In 2011, we had 99, and this year, up to October, we only have one uh, confirmed case. According to Dr. Joyce, there's another one confirmed case which was detected in San Lazaro, but either way, dalawa lang po yung confirmed ngayon. So I think uh, the campaign was very effective here in our region. Next. Issues in the implementation of the campaign in CAR, refusals, 
Uh, these are some of the reasons for refusing. Of course, we have the religion, religious practices. And this one, private MDs. Uh, many of the mothers claim that uh, their private doctors did not approve them or did not uh, tell them to, or uh, what do you call this one? Actually, they disapproved of, <laughs> of the child getting an additional measles or rubella vaccination. Other reasons for refusing misconceptions and personal beliefs regarding immunization. Some were downright stubborn in not letting their kids be vaccinated. Other reasons, kids on, vaccine, on vacation, I mean. And of course, the door-to-door -door strategy was not strictly implemented in our region. Uh, of course, uh, the issues on terrain, the weather, and the population issues was not included in here. Next, please. Uh, we go to the new vaccines. So originally, in EPI, we had uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six vaccines which uh, uh, protected us from seven diseases. Uh, five for, I mean, BCG, hepatitis B, DPT, OPV, and anti measles vaccine for the children, and tetanus toxoid for pregnant mothers. Next, please. Uh, when you read EPI, it says expanded program on immunization. Uh, what we're doing now is we're expanding the already expanded program on immunization. Uh, in 2010, we introduced the MMR, Missile Moms Rubella. This will provide a second opportunity for children not protected against missiles during their first dose at nine months to 11 months of age. This MMR will be, uh, is being given at 12 to 15 months of age. Uh, just last year, we introduced, uh, this year, I mean, yeah, this year we introduced the rotavirus vaccine. This provides protection against the urea caused by the rotavirus. The first dose is given 6 to 15 weeks, maximum of 15 weeks. And the second dose is 10 to 32 weeks, maximum of 32 weeks. Next, please. Uh, another vaccine, new vaccine, is the pentavalent vaccine. I think it was announced earlier. This, is, this consists of the hepatitis B, hemophilus influenza B, and the DPT. Uh, HIV infections can be deadly in the forms of uh, meningitis and pneumonia in under five children. Three doses of this pentavalent vaccine will be given at 6, 10, and 14 weeks of age. Although it has been started in the other regions in CAR, we are still awaiting the delivery of these vaccines. Next, please. Another one is the adult immunization for senior citizens. Uh, they're being given the influenza vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccine, although it has been said that uh, only, the NH only the senior citizens which belong to the indigent or NHTS families will be given. Upcoming vaccines, we have the Adolescent Immunization Program. Although it has not yet been included in the program on immunization, I think it will be. It has been proposed that MMR and tetanus toxoid will be given to adolescents age 10 to 19. Uh, initially, HPV was included in this program, but uh, the, uh, <laughs> the uh, sponsor of the HPV backed out. So up to this time, only MMR and the tetanus toxide is planned to be given. And coming in the future is the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which will be given to children. Uh, it, will be give, it will be implemented 2013. Challenges and issues. Ah, okay. Uh, number one, with the introduction of the rotavirus, the senior citizen uh, vaccines, 
which are single dose vaccines, we had a problem on cold chain storage. Uh, because the single dose vaccines takes a lot of space in our uh, vaccine refrigerators. So we, we were not able to anticipate this uh, problem at the implementation level. Uh, so, so they are now having problems on uh, cold chain storage. Second is the low uptake or public acceptance of the new vaccines. Also, although these are free, the rotavirus, the MMR, uh, I think our uh, information and education campaign regarding these vaccines, including the social preparation, is inadequate. Uh, we need to uh, inform the public of these vaccines. Another issue is the presence of anti-immunization advocates, uh, the so-called naturalists. Huwag na yung bakuna, baya mo silang magkasakit para maka develop sila ng immune system. And of course, with the uh, internet, uh, so many mothers are uh, going to the internet, visiting the internet, and of course, there are many anti-immunization advocates also in the internet. Another challenge is the priority recipients of uh, new vaccines, uh, the NHTS families, like the rotavirus vaccine, this was uh, planned to be given only for NHTS families, but this, this, it is very difficult for the implementers to look for the NHTS targets. Correct? Yes, no. Yes, no. Yes, no. Uh, but if, anyway, we opened it to every, to every child, actually. Uh, again, the issue on adverse events following immunization. Of course, our vaccines are very safe, but it is not entirely without uh, risks. So we have these adverse events. And these adverse events can range from mild to life-threatening adverse events like uh, anaphylaxis. And if uh, these AF AEFIs are not uh, properly managed, uh, the community will have uh, no trust in our program. Another issue is the issue on coverage. As you have seen, we have a very low coverage, especially here in CAR, mainly because as a program coordinator, I think it's population-based. Uh, but our true, the true coverage of CAR cannot be uh, seen in our reports because the private sector is not giving their accomplishments to us, only in Baguio, I think, and it's not even complete. So uh, that's one of the issues that we would like to answer. We would like the private sector to be able to report to us their accomplish accomplishments regarding immunization of children. Next. Okay. So that was my last slide. Uh, let me leave you with this. Alone we can do so little. Together we can do so much by Helen Keller. Thank you, Bob. I'm not going to make your lives easier, okay, because you saw the lecture and I'm sure you saw some of the challenges and the issues. We are not, you are not going to stand up and not work for your lunch. So once again, this is interactive, so we'd like to welcome questions. But before that, I'd like to call on stage our two reactors. Dr. Ulep and Mrs. Serna may I ask you to come up. I th Can I, uh, would anybody like to throw the first question or probably help us solve the problem that have been put towards you? Mom, it's too soft. You can have my. Do we have another mic? Mom, paka it's conking out. Very interesting presentation, and I am so overwhelmed by the fact that. You know, I, I came in a little bit late, but the missiles, I really had to clap and, and really congratulate the car for having uh, one missiles for 20, 
2011 or 2012 after having so many cases. And this is really the evidence that we need for everyone to be convinced that indeed vaccine is the most effective way to prevent and save those children from dying. What I am uh, kind of curious about, and this was presented uh, by our presenter, is the fact that there seems to be a low uptake. That, that um, experience that they have, a low uptake for new vaccines, and the public being unconvinced or something about the new vaccines, and not being, not going for what the new vaccines, and I know that the new vaccines would be the pentavalent, I guess, the hip, the rotavirus. Why, why this? But because um, if the government or if the local center is already giving it to children, uh, the six weeks, 10 weeks, 14 weeks, I wonder how do they respond? If you say we are now having a new vaccine, rotavirus, for example, and then you will say this is a vaccine that can save children from severe diarrhea, the most common dehydrating and severe diarrhea for children that often gets them to the hospital and could actually cause deaths when not, in, or when not uh, treated adequately. I wonder why women or mothers would refuse such. And that would tell me now uh, how to go about uh, doing it for the other regions in the Philippines where rotavirus, for example, or the other vaccines pentavalent or MMR or whatever new vaccines would be there. I mean, what, what is it? What, what do mothers say? Why do they refuse such? Yes, yes, doctor. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, for the, you mentioned about uh, the public being unconvinced. I think it's not a problem of uh, them being unconvinced. It's just a problem of uh, us having uh, I mean, we were not able to really prepare them uh, for the arrival of the new vaccines. Uh, the information and education campaign for these new vaccines was inadequate. Uh, it's, it's not that they're not convinced. Uh, actually, when we are telling them, uh, many of them have their uh, children subjected to this immunization. And uh, one, the, the issues on the refusals, I think it was uh, mentioned in my presentation. So you're talking about religion, that's yes, one, sir. okay? Yes. And you're talking about private entities. Are there a lot of private doctors uh, refusing? Uh, that, that, that was for the campaign last year. That was what the health implementers, those who went around it, Immunizing children uh, gave uh, gave us, I mean, told us as, as a reason for the refusals. They were not able to penetrate, for example, subdivisions. Uh, they were not able to enter subdivisions because uh, in these subdivisions or these rich communities, uh, this was what they told them. Uh, we have uh, private MDs, and when they called up their private doctors, their doctor said, "No, never mind. Don't let them." It's okay. Something like Okay. So, Dr. Bravo and then Dr. Mantaliano. That there is a lot of campaign among private practitioners and uh, I mean the pediatricians here who still say to their patients, do not let your child be immunized against missiles because you have been already given the missiles. You know, you should really have to think and rethink that because the vaccine that we give is really more not for the individual but for the public health and everyone here should be aware that public health takes priority uh, in, in, over the individual in terms of vaccination because otherwise you know it's too selfish to think about that but what and we do need to campaign and PPS I think where's the PPS chapter here should really do that make sure that we People, the pediatricians are aware of this kind of thinking of our private pediatricians or even the public, private sector. But what I am really concerned about, and I don't think that was answered very uh, kind of completely yet, is the fact that if a mother comes to the center and then you tell them there's a new vaccine, for example, the rotavirus that will be given, 
Why would they refuse? Of course, unless it's against the religion, that you cannot really, uh, you know, convince them because religion is really something that, uh, as far as vaccine ethics is concerned, you cannot, you cannot really neutralize. It's, it's religion. But that's only a very small part. So the challenge for us is really, for, for the center physicians, for the MDs there, is to really point out to the mothers that, in fact, I always say that they are so fortunate that the rotavirus is being given. How much is a rotavirus in a private setting? 3,000 pesos, my dear, isn't it? Rotavirus vaccine, 3,000. And here it is being given for free in the local center. Sabi nga ng mga doktor, ay, nakulaw ako na, wala na kami. But here you are. How can you really refuse such such offer? And I really hope that the local physicians or the health center physicians would really promote that in a way that the people will appreciate the value that the Department of Health, Joyce Lupus in there, has really done its part in bringing to the people these new vaccines that could save them from hospitalization, that could save them even their lives, the children's lives. So, yung sinasabi nga nung na low uptake and you still need to educate the public. Yes, you need to educate the public on the new vaccine. But when they're already there in the center, yun na yun eh, one on one na yun eh. So, yun yung medyo na nababother lang ako why they would refuse when they're already in the center. Uh, Actually, po, when they come to the center, uh, wala naman yung nag like, refuse if you told them already the benefits and it's free, and then uh, you, you tell them yun nga yung mga benefits. Wala naman po nag refuse uh, What I mean by the low uptake is that uh, many of the parents still don't know that these vaccines are available. So, uh, yun nga sabi niyo po, yung advocacy and information campaign in telling the public that these vaccines are uh, there, are free, are available, Yun po ang dapat nating i-strengthen po. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? So this, this law uptake and public acceptance of new vaccines, uh, I agree that before you start the vaccination, you should you know, announce to the public that such a vaccine will become available on this and this. You know? uh, kasi in, like in Vietnam, when they give a vaccine, there is only one vaccination day every week. It's done every Friday, and it's simultaneous in all the health centers. Simultaneously, on once a week lang, sabay sabay, you know, it's done. But kasi in in our country, buti nga sa atin is because they come, if they come, you give, you know. So of course there are some schedules because uh, multi-vaccines should be given right immediately. You have to consume the vaccine right away. But just like as I've said, kailangan kasi you have to go around, announce, make use of your barangay to go around the community kasi nga, if they can go around and will say, oh, uh, what's this? No parking dito in my, in, my, in my barangay in Makati. They always go around and say, oh, if they can go around and say, please, only one side parking, only one side parking. Why can't the, I mean, the, the, from the health center or from the health uh, department of the municipal, they go around and say, okay, we're immunizing this day on ganito, ganito, so they can come. Or we do have a vaccine that will be, that's new, it will be given for free, so they can come, you know. Kasi yung Yun nga what Lulu is saying, when the mother come, uh, goes to the uh, center and they have already the chance. Madali na yung makonvince eh. Makakausap mo yan. Unless of course, uh, ang mahirap yung mga anti-vaccinist na yan. No? Na yun, yun ang matagal kausapin. It takes time. Pero uh, since you're already in it na sa public health, tiyagaan na lang ninyong kausapin yung mga mothers. Kasi minsan, alam mo, makulit din sila. And really, it takes time to talk to them and convince them. Kasi you cannot just say, oh, bakuna ngayon, turok. Hindi, hindi ba pwede yung ganun, you know? 
that, that is something that uh, we do not want kasi uh, ethically, we're supposed to really inform them of the benefits and the risks. But just like as I've said kanina, the, some of the MDs there nakalagay uh, tell their parents not to have the vaccine. Okay? Um, this was because of the concept na hindi, I think, some of them do not know that even if you give multiple antigens of the measles vaccine, it does not overwhelm the immune system. Okay? And that's why, why we are giving multiple I mean, doses of the measles virus is because we want to address the primary vaccine failures. So, kaya dala merong second dose. We don't call it booster. And this is what some of these um, children are having. That's why you had an outbreak, maybe because of low coverage, no? Or maybe because the vaccine, the first vaccine that was given was a failure. Pero when you say, ay, failure pa rin kasi baka some of you may get my message wrong. Even, even in other countries, uh, the vaccine really have about 15% no, vaccine failures. And this is not because of the vaccine itself, but because the potency may have waned. Kasi from the manufacturer to the end user, baka there must have been some cold chain changes. No? So there are so many factors. Mga problematic, siyempre, sinabi mo, ibigay mo ng sub-Q. Paano binigay? Intradermal. Yung mga ganon. So yung, and given at not the uh, age supposed to be the child should receive it. Kasi naman ang measles natin, di ba Joyce? Ang atin is nine months. Okay? We always, we, that is a compromise that we had, di ba? Because it's supposed to be at one year of age. But we did, the, the uh, Department of Health opted to have the nine months kasi because there has been studies done here in our country that six months old babies no, no longer have a percentage, a large percentage of our six months old do not have any more antibodies against measles, the maternal antibodies. So they just made the compromise because you have uh, a lot of vaccines that you were giving and you were also doing it on a catch-up for those who did not get it at the 6, 10, 14 weeks. So, nine months talaga bigay. Just to see that baka mamaya mas marami ng walang antibodies to interfere with the vaccine that would be given, that would be the most appropriate time to give. Pero they've seen it already and they've addressed it now by having the MR and the MMR. So, Maputi nga tayo because it is being recognized. Uh, no? And that it shows that the Department of Health is looking into it in the scientific way. You know, They address it na because this is the problem, let's do it that way. So now it's now you know, one year of age. And now they're also addressing it in the adolescent. It's because the, the, pay, the subjects or the patients that are having this missiles are now a lot more in the age group of the adolescents, older children. So, kaya there is that, ano, that uh, adolescent now that they are addressing. So, I guess maybe it's just information dissemination, letting them know why the program is so. Kasi minsan, even the private sector, hindi rin nila naintindihan, like they were asking me always, eh, bakit MR? Hindi MMR ang binigay ng gobyerno. No? That was always the question, no? Although, lahat, ay mga may measles outbreak, eh bakit MR ang binigay, hindi MMR na lang? See? Of course, cost dead is one. Tsaka nakita din naman kasi that it's the MR ang dapat addressin. Kasi because some measles like is rubella. They were diagnosed as measles, but they were in fact rubella. So kaya yun na lang ang inaddress. Okay? Mumps does not present as measles. So, they were addressing the outbreak right away. Pero, after the control, mag-MMR na. Di ba, Joyce? Do you want to add something? Points on the low coverage for the new introduction. 
Based on our experience, any vaccine that is introduced in the public health for two years, we will always have a low coverage. So it's more on the operational issues, and uh, especially in our recording and reporting. Vaccines are utilized, but the report is low. It's because in our standard reporting system, these vaccines are not included in the target client list. So it's a special reporting, so some health workers would not uh, record it and report to the next administrative level. This happens with the hepatitis B birth dose as well as that of the MMR. Okay? The second point here, it's not only the mother that has to be blamed for this, but as well as the health workers, because there are also health workers who would not have or give two injectables at the same time that the child went for the immunization schedule. Okay? So it's also one of our target for our education. And the last is of also the mother also. So, Dr. Marrero, you did say about the refusal, so I guess from the inputs of Dr. May and Dr. Bravo, I guess the key here is information, thorough information, thorough, you have to embark on educational campaigns, so I guess for us, most health workers are women, you can probably bank on your being uh, a non-stop what? A talker, if you could say, a nag, a nag for immunization, for, for advocating uh, the cause of immunization. Dr. Dukusin, I would just like to take off from that problem of yours. You were saying that there are some, with the introduction of new vaccines, there is a special report. So for the, for the first two years, even if it is utilized, then it is not reported. So what could be one of the solutions that we could probably, in, in our own local government, because I know that it's quite difficult. Disseminating policies or reporting in itself is, is a huge uh, task to undertake. So what is one solution that we can uh, probably suggest so that we can overcome this problem? or stated that the, the recording and the report. Okay? So one way to have really, or to improve on this, is to do a supportive supervision and monitoring by the supervisors or the next administrative level. Supportive. I, super um, yeah. Because in the orientation, recording and reporting is part of that guidelines. Okay? So now, it's now on the monitoring or the supporting supervision of that policy. Okay, so I hope everybody heard that. So you are going to help in the supplementary immunization campaign was a success. I was looking at your statistics and I was so proud because your car was even higher than NCR. So what was the strategy that you used? That's why you had such a lot of, uh, you had a very big coverage and I, after Dr. Marrero, I'd also like to ask Dr. Ulep and Mrs. Serna about their input with regard to the strengths of the strategies that you uh, employ. Uh, Doctor, uh, I think by national standards, uh, the 82% is not a success uh, also, because we were going for 95% coverage. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Ma'am Serna and Dr. Ulep is in a bit ah, they are in a better position to answer the strategies oh, so on sorry. why we had uh, for me doctor i consider that a success yung 82 percent po pero for yung you, mga you national success. coordinator po namin yung mga director namin hindi po because kasi the, nga po 95 percent yung or, or probably kasi i was looking at like you were saying your measles isa na lang Yes, po, so from an 86 to 99. Yes, no? po. so in, uh -huh. in all probability, very success, uh, successful. Uh, what was the reason for that? I'd like, to, I'd like to know the strategy behind that. 
successful campaign. I mean, to just have one or two. Okay. Uh -huh. For for the Center for Health Development, po, uh, already prepared for this campaign. So there was advocacy meetings, and we had launchings in every province, in every municipality, and also in the city. So we gathered the uh, local chief executives and uh, explained to them on why uh, we are doing this campaign and got their support up to the barangay level actually. Okay, so probably that is one strategy we can implement for the new vaccines. Uh, yes, well, uh, just to go back to what Dr. Carr was saying a while ago, I totally agree that we should first uh, tell the public uh, that these vaccines are available before implementing. Uh, okay, so it's more of a... You have to have a very deep, uh, let's say, bench. In a say, not deep bench. How would I say? You have to be adequately prepared before giving the vaccine. So it's more of a massive information education exactly. campaign. Exactly. Okay, so that's one strategy, Mrs. Ulep. I sorry, Mrs. Sengson. Good afternoon. So uh, I would like to speak for Barbie City. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to tell that uh, our report for FIC in 2011 is 94.68%. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, we had no laboratory Sobrang excited ni ma'am kasi sabi niya wala kami. We are so proud that we you didn't have any cases. Actually, uh, the high coverage is uh, because of our partnership with our uh, more than 50 pediatricians in Baguio City. And uh, we have also our partner in the government that is the Baguio General Hospital Medical Center under 5 clinic. Actually, the problem here is the reporting. Uh, we the are reporting. not able to get yes. the report yes. of all of the uh, private pediatricians. Okay. Actually, that's also a problem in the NCR because you do not know the percentage of uh, patients are seen by the private MD. The private MDs do not report the ones that are the vaccines that have been given. So that's also a problem. But we're very happy because you did say that the partnership, like what Dr. Bravo was saying, the local uh, chapter of the involving the pediatricians, both the government, okay, so that would be the pediatricians would be the NGOs in a sense. Okay, so a strong partnership is one way you can be assured of uh, higher coverage. Actually, I would like to tell also that uh, our HEP B1 have been within 24 hours with our uh, facility-based delivery that is 99%, oh, that's only... we are able to cover at least 98%. So before the infant, the newborn is discharged from our five hospitals, 98% of them are already given BCG and the uh, HEPA B within 24 hours. So. The support is really there with the uh, private pediatricians and our five hospitals. So uh, only 60% is being accomplished in our 16 district health centers for Baguio. When you say 60% of reporting? Uh, uh, no, uh, our reporting for the uh, purely FHSIS is 60%. Okay. It's about 60%. But when oh. we consolidate for the annual EPI report, Higher. We include the under five clinic and uh, some of the private pediatricians. Okay. Dr. Ulep, could you tell us some of your success stories? <laughs> Good afternoon to each Good afternoon. afternoon. Uh, in the province of Benguet, uh, I truly agree with uh, Dr. Marrero that uh, we had uh, social preparation, we had uh, mobilized uh, societies. We have uh, created uh, the community health teams, uh, which we call in uh, the vernacular as EBAMAC, which means uh, it's actually an acronym, which means uh, Efficient Barangay Action for Maternal and Child Health. That's right, efficient. Is, 
uh, Barangay Action for Maternal and Child Health, which is actually collaborating with the uh, EPI coordinators and also with the health education uh, promotion officers. So during the Mr. Sia, uh, actually even in uh, churches during the uh, services, they announced the, that there will be an uh, activity for uh, immunization. And uh, also uh, in barangay gatherings or community gatherings, uh, uh, the uh, constituents were informed. And during the implementation of the Mr. Sia, there, there were uh, uh, there was a team for monitors who went to uh, the different principalities to conduct the uh, monitoring supervision. And we also have uh, our uh, program implementation review, uh, which we conduct uh, regularly for uh, the expanded uh, program on immunization. And one of the best practices in the province of Benguet, we have actually uh, crafted a monitoring tool for all the programs that would include the expanded uh, program on uh, immunization. So, so we have a checklist uh, that would include uh, cold chain uh, management also. And uh, although uh, we have limited training opportunities, uh, some of uh, the health workers were uh, trained on uh, API. Thank you, Dr. Ulep. From the audience, do you have any, are there things you'd like to ask? Are there certain practices that help you improve immunization coverage in your areas? I'm so lucky I have Dr. May and Dr. Bravo around because, see? Okay, Dr. May, please. <laughs> the priest said, uh, it's not for vaccination, but it was for tuberculosis. And I said, wow, they have, they have this, okay, you will have to go on these days, on this and this, because we have increasing incidence of tuberculosis. You go for a chest x-ray and so on and so, on, so forth. And I, I, I said, bakit hindi natin magawa sa atin? I mean, involve all this, this, because we really go to church. And if, you know, and some of them even use the church as a venue for the immunization. Some of them use that, you know, and that's why I said, "Galing naman." That's it's the first time I've heard it that they, they they did it here, and I congratulate them because that's really a very good thing because they're already there. And alam na, nagsimba ka na. I mean, always if if it's the priest, most of the time they will say, "Ah, sinabi pa na ng priest namin or pastor namin na it's good to be vaccinated." Then if he's convinced with it, oh, sige. It's just like you know. Kung sino yung governing body, kung sino yung presidente, magpabakuna siya, just like what Mayor Dumongan has done, then everybody maybe will be convinced that if he himself had the vaccine, why can't I not have it also? You know? Well, because maybe the problem lang of the law, other, like yung HEP nyo, doctora, or doctor, the one that I saw, the law coverage doon sa ano, it's maybe because, you know, hindi... Because I told diba kanina that we compute for the whole birth cohort, di ba? Yung po bang report niyo sa inyong HEPB uh, includes the private hospitals? Okay, mabuti yun. Because uh, not all private hospitals do have the HEPB vaccine at birth. Usually what is done is it's the private pediatricians who are giving the vaccine. And that's a deterrent to the parents because some of them have not budgeted the HEPB vaccine to be you know, in their budget when they deliver. But, but if it is for free, then maybe they will agree to have the vaccine. If it is already computed as birth cohort, then that vaccine should reach all private institutions or hospitals to have their vaccine at the nursery. And, be man and all the medical directors be mandated that this vaccine is a mandated vaccine by law. And they should give this. Siguro, gawin ang, this strategy, gawin ang 
Hep B vaccination as part of accreditation ng hospital. Come from what you said, Dr. May, you said the church. I was just thinking, um, are there suggestions from the group, aside from the church, other social places? I don't know about malls. I don't know about movie houses. Schools. Schools. Where else? I heard uh, from this group, malls. Okay, where in the mall? SM. <laughs> Did SM support us? Okay, so, all right. So, where else? So, this gives us ideas aside from making it part. Yes? This group is intent on working for their lunch tomorrow. You're going to be given extra lunch because you're participating. <laughs> Kidding. Anywhere else? Plaza. Town plazas. Okay, where else? I mean, this has to be a gathering of uh, thoughts that we can consolidate so that we can cover more, ch more children. One, of, before um, anything else, I, I, I was just thinking a while back, you said that immunization is a basic right. I agree with you totally. Um, you still encounter people who come to you and say, we went to the health center, but we weren't able to get the vaccine because this particular vaccine was being sold for a certain price. And you did say that that would involve some form of a fine or a wrap on the wrist. So is that still happening? Hello. Yes, doctor. Unfortunately, through the years, we have been uh, hearing reports of uh, an RHU providing uh, immunization services and letting their, uh, I mean, charging yes. their uh, clients for that. And of course, we, we made the appropriate measures for that. Uh, through monitoring and supervision, we are, we are continuously looking for those RHUs. I'm just curious, what is the ultimate fine when you do get to see that this is happening or this involves a few? You are smiling, but... What is the ultimate fine? Because see, um, um, correct me, for the vaccines in the EPI, you are mandated to give it by law. Yes. So if you do not give it as a doctor, then you can go to jail. Is that true? Uh, I no, no, it's not, ma'am. Because here in the Philippines, with murder, you can get away with murder. If you don't get the vaccine or you don't give the vaccine, you get to go to jail. I think it's a little too extreme. So. I heard something about that. Dr. Joyce, you're smiling at me. Because EPI is mandated by law, so if I do not give it, I'm a pediatrician, I'm going to go behind bars? No, so that's not true. Okay. So, going back, Dr. Marrero, what's the worst thing that one can expect if such a practice is still being done? Uh, we do not have uh, penal clauses for that, actually. Oh, we do uh, not have? Uh, but I always say that uh, that's ne negligence. Yes, okay. And then I always say to the health workers that you'll not be able to get your retirement. Uh, oh, you'll not be able to get your retirement. What do you call that one? Oh, yeah, something like your be benefits, yeah, your retirement benefits. benefits. Okay, so that's enough to scare them. But it's not enough for them to be like stricken out of the list. No, okay. So do you agree there should be a heavier penalty? Yes, I heard this group say yes. What do you think, Dr. May? Because these, these vaccines that are being sold in the health centers have been reported by pediatricians to the Philippine Pediatric Society. And we have always been asked to come up with a stand. And we've said that the government had already laid down, you know, these things. All health care care workers are mandated by law. All of us, even though the private, even also the private doctors, you are mandated. It's a law. And nobody's above the law. It, the thing is, we have to implement it. And their question and their concern, the pediatricians were saying, the healthcare workers are selling vaccines and are given vaccines. And they were saying, uh, why is this so? And I've said they've been mandated by the government to give vaccines, but within 
the EPI program. Because there are vaccines outside of the EPI. So that's why, uh, to be, I don't know, doctor, uh, uh, doctor, if your healthcare workers, after completing the fully immunized child definition, do they say that there are still vaccines that your child needs and that you can seek this out with your private doctors? Because when we say the child is fully immunized, when we see them in private practice or in anything that we do, just like when we do some researches, they will say, Ito, kumpleto na po ang bakuna namin eh. Sabi po sa health center, lahat natanggap na namin. Wala na kaming kailangan. See? But that is not, that is not what you see in our recommended immunization schedule. Please remember the recommended immunization schedule. They are recommended because of merits, but they are not all mandated by the government. So that's why in the EPI in the schedule, we do have two boxes, one for the EPI vaccines and one for vaccines outside of the EPI schedule. These are vaccines that have merits and that should be given to children. So after the fully immunized child, they should go for a booster because the government do not give a booster. So, uh, to me, some of the doctors will say, eh, kasi baka mag, pag sinabi namin, baka mag-demand sa gobyerno to provide these other vaccines. It's just up to you to tell them that each and one of us have a responsibility to ourselves and to the community and not everything can be given by the government. Kahit nga kayo ay yung anak ninyo, hindi pwede. Ito lang ang kaya ng ating budget. This is a manner that the government will say, this is only what we can afford, this is what the budget that we have. So ito lang muna. Pag mayaman na tayo, then we will have all the rest. Diba ganun din kayo sa, ganun sa family? Why can't we not treat it, the, the government, just like our family na, oh, hindi pala pwede kasi kulang ang budget. So I guess maybe that's how you will just explain, make explanations to your patients so that if and when they demand, you just say, this is only the money we have that can procure these vaccines. But there are other vaccines which you should avail to protect your child from these other diseases. That's it. Thank you, Dr. May. Now I have a mic so you could hold on. Do you do that? You tell them that there are other vaccines. These are the only vaccines we have, but your child would be needing boosters in these other vaccines. Is that a practice amongst uh, the healthcare workers or the center physicians? Uh, right now, it's not a routine at both in the part of the health workers to advocate for, for vaccines outside the uh, expanded okay. program on immunization. But I think that's a very valid point yes. for doctor. Okay, so, so okay. Uh, Mrs. Ulep, uh, Dr. Ulep and Mrs. Sengson, are there any other things you'd like to add so that we could expand coverage or uh, give solutions to the problems that face us with regards to immunization? Dr. Ulep. So maybe if we can address the issues faced by uh, Dr. Marero Avalago, maybe we can improve our uh, coverage. And uh, with the in improved uh, coverage, maybe we can now decrease the uh, infant mortality rates or the under five mortality rates. And by 2015, we would be able to meet the uh, 95%. So we do hope that uh, we will be able to uh, attain the 95% of 2015, which is around three years from now. Which is not an impossibility. Because I was looking at it. The trend is going down at least. Mrs. Serna, our public health nurse. I'm so impressed for 35 years you've been doing your own advocacy. Yes, Mrs. So regarding uh, our practice for Baguio City, what uh, we need is the report from our partners in the uh, Philippine Pediatric Society for the report so that we can see the true picture of the immunization coverage 
for our eligible target in Baguio City. Then regarding our other vaccines, actually uh, some mothers come to us, they are asking if there is a need for their children to be immunized with other vaccines and uh, we actually advise them also to go uh, to their uh, pediatrician if uh, they, they are uh, being advised to help. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity for the uh, support of our partners, our uh, under five uh, clinic, and uh, of course our pediatricians and the five hospitals in Baguio City for supporting the program because uh, public health cannot do it alone. So we are there and uh, I believe that the right answer to the right of every child to be immunized is uh, the right partnership among these stakeholders. So let us continue with the partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, from what she said, I felt that she was campaigning. Okay? Campaigning for higher coverage. Don't you agree? Okay, so are there any other um, issues you'd like to raise from the floor? If there are none, it's close to 3 o'clock or it's 3 o'clock, so we're going to present the input from this workshop after the other groups come down. So we'd like you to stay. We'd like to thank Dr. Marrero, Dr. Uleb, and Mrs. Serna for their valuable input. Thank you very much. Very shy, though, It must be. Okay, and uh, Mrs. Serna will kill me. I changed her last name. And Dr. Ule. Coming up to bat. Okay, Dr. Ule and Mrs. Serna. The first workshop was done on the role of medical and paramedical societies. There were three panelists from the Baguio Benguet Medical Society, Dr. Adrian Clara. From the Philippine Pediatric Society, Northern Luzon Chapter was Dr. Reynelda Ruñez. And from the Philippine Nurses Association was Ms. Jeannie Austria. To present the workshop outputs of the first group, may I call on the facilitator, Dr. Carmina de los Reyes. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to present the output of the first group. Our task was actually to discuss how the medical and paramedical societies can optimize vaccine use through the creation and strengthening of vaccine advocacy groups. So we had this general objective in mind to discuss measures or strategies directed towards creating and or strengthening disease awareness and prevention through vaccination among the various stakeholders and to share best practices and experiences encountered in the course of implementation of EPI vaccines at the local health center, focusing on the role of nurses and midwives. We had um, the able assistance of our distinguished panelists in the person of doctors Adrian Calera from the Baguio Benguet Medical Society, Dr. Reynelda Ruñez from the Philippine Pediatric Society Northern Luzon Chapter, and Ms. Jeannie Austria from the DOH and Philippine Nurses Association. So on the part of the Philippine Pediatric Society, it is able to optimize vaccine use in its involvement in community service and child advocacy programs by being staunch advocates and being the frontliners in the immunization processes. And it is also actively involved in information dissemination campaigns to encourage and improve immunization coverage. For the Philippine Nurses Association and midwives, it is actively involved in quality vaccine assurance and in the vaccine procurement process. It is also involved in quality vaccination processes. So they ensure that the vaccines are not just in the storage areas and they make sure that they reach the children who actually need them most. 
They also involve themselves in continuing professional education through trainings and CPG development. They also network with the private practitioners, vaccine stakeholders, and local health authorities to further improve vaccine coverage. On the part of the Baguio Benguet Medical Society, it plans to hold CMEs through RTDs to disseminate and update its members regarding newer vaccines and possible vaccination programs. It also strengthens, plans to strengthen its information drive by utilizing the social media in the form of Facebook and Yahoo groups. It also plans to concentrate on vaccine preventable diseases as subjects for future RTDs and CMEs it aims to utilize its local newsletter and local publications as well that will promote to its members the value of vaccination. It plans to promote and support researches involving vaccines and at present it coordinates with various component societies such as the OBGYN, PPS, etc. to strengthen the implementation of its immunization activities. It also plans to utilize the academe to correct wrong notions on immunization by harnessing their faculty members who happen to be members of the society as well. There were inadequacies on existing programs which were identified, like for the DOH. Um, they are not able to get a true picture of the EPI vaccine coverage for the region because they do not get the data from the private practitioners and the local health society suggests this uh, topic as a venue for research and to be able to address this problem they plan to engage the private practitioners to give their data on vaccine coverage and as a resolution to reactivate the existing program on this because the problem identified was um, the lack of um, a point person to collect the data from the private practitioners. Um, there were also ways which were identified on how existing programs can be improved. And uh, one issue was to be able to uh, make the vaccine more accessible, like for example, for the cervical uh, cancer vaccine, uh, red price reduction will ultimately be able to ensure um, widespread vaccine coverage. And uh, the, the, uh, the vaccine advocates should coordinate with other vaccine stakeholders to make these vaccines available to all. And also, coordination with the government and medical societies regarding vaccination schedules to be followed by the local uh, health centers administering the childhood vaccines was also given as an example. Uh, so, for example, for the hepatitis B vaccine for the local health centers, the 6, 10, uh, 14 weeks uh, schedule is being followed, but for um, private practi practitioners, as per um, our 2012 immunization schedule recommendation, we utilize the 016 schedule. So. To be able to address this issue, uh, maybe the government side and private medical societies should again um, sit together to be able to harmonize these schedules and ultimately just follow one schedule to decrease confusions and further problems. So I think that's it for our group's output. Thank you. She put some important points for us and perhaps the PFD will collate all this and we'll see what, what they, we can all do together. Now may I call on the moderator facilitator for the second workshop which was partnering with civic organizations, NGOs, and the PhilHealth to present their workshop output. Dr. Shelly Ann De La Vega. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. So our group partnered with uh, civic organizations, NGOs, and PhilHealth. So we had, uh, for our attendees, we had physicians uh, from the government, private practitioners, and company physicians. We also had representatives from senior citizens group here in Baguio, and we had nurses. So for our speakers, we had Mr. Leopoldo Escaño as a, as a representative from the senior citizen group, uh, Dr. Dominga Gadgad from the PhilHealth, and Mr. Ray Abeliada from the Rotary Club of Baguio. So for the senior citizens group, their major concern was where um, health care and rehabilitation care, so the facilities and uh, this facility should be accessible and they should be at a considerable cost. And uh, they were also advocating for free vaccination for indigent senior citizen, especially influenza and pneumococcal vaccine. And they would also want to amend the criteria for indigent senior citizen. And they also shared with us that they had a five-year anti-pneumonia campaign, which was done in one barangay here in Baguio, where they received uh, good feedback. For the field health, uh, Dr. Gadgad discussed the different field health packages which are related to vaccines. So we had the newborn care package where uh, there was the BCG and hepatitis B vaccine, and this will cover 1,750 pesos. And the, uh, we also have the animal bite package uh, this should be May 3, 2012, uh, which will cover the rabies vaccine, rabies immunoglobulin, your anti-tetanus. Uh, uh, this is a post-exposure prophylaxis for Category 3 patients, and they can cover up to 3,000 pesos. And lastly, they were happy to announce that just yesterday, uh, MSD partnered with uh, Baguio General Hospital and they have the project 50 plus na ako at Oksang Bakong na ko laban sa pulmonya where they offer where they can offer the pneumococcal vaccine for only 600 pesos to senior citizens. So for the Rotary Club, they discussed about their project, the Global Polio Eradication Initiatives and they have been um, working for more than 25 years. They are leading the private sector in the global effort to rid the world from polio. So their goal is to eradicate polio 100%. Our resolutions were to study the Rotary Program, a, success, a successful private-public partnership model to be adopted by similar organizations to assist the senior citizens in their desire to avail of free or discounted flu and pneumococcal vaccine and to revise the definition for indigent senior citizens. Also, that the PhilHealth should uh, continue to echo and disseminate the current vaccine programs so that they can be availed by the PhilHealth members and to encourage all Filipinos to be a PhilHealth member and to engage the PhilHealth uh, to support for more vaccine programs. Thank you. Have the presentation of the output from the third workshop on vaccine policies and programs of the local government units. May I call on my good friend, Dr. Fatima Timi Jimenez. Okay. Certainly, you do not have a choice but to stay and listen to me because I'm the third person who's going to give you the output of the group. Our attendees were uh, a merry mix, okay? But we all had a very pediatric outlook and very excited to look at the issues and possible solutions. So the issues that were presented by Dr. Marrero to the group are as follows. They encountered a lot of vaccine refusals in CAR due to the following. Religious beliefs, private doctors saying that um, you shouldn't go to the local or the RHUs to obtain your vaccines. The door-to-door -door strategy was not strictly followed because some of them could not pen penetrate the subdivisions or the private subdivisions. And some of the children were on vacation at that time. They did the campaign. There were also um, certain groups like naturalists, the so-called anti-immunization advocates, 
that were present in the community. That was an issue. Next is priority recipients of new vaccines. You know that with the introduction of the new vaccines in the EPI, it is targeted towards the poorest of the poor. But um, this was a problem. And Dr. Marrero said the reason was because there was not enough preparation done with regard to information education campaigns. Next is some of the parents also had, let's say, apprehensions about the adverse events okay, that could follow immunization. And one thing that we got to probably um, give importance to was the issue of reporting. Okay, next slide, please. So, Dr. Bravo started the session and asked why there was such a low intake or low uptake and why was there uh, certain or difficulty in the public acceptance of new vaccines. As I have said previously, subdivisions could not be penetrated. Some doctors instructed mothers to refuse vaccination from the RHU. The vaccines were utilized, but there was some form of underreporting. We were lucky Dr. Dukusian was in our midst and she said that for the first two years of the introduction of new vaccines, though it is utilized, there is problem reporting because it is in a separate report. Okay, it's not that we are not utilizing the vaccines, but there is under-reporting. And for some healthcare workers, it's also nice that we had that beautiful lecture from Dr. May Montaliano. Some of them are also wary about giving two vaccines at the same time. So these were some of the challenges and issues in the implementation of the EPI. Next slide, please. What were the solutions? In a nutshell, I would just like to say that information education campaigns actually would hit the target if you would like to be an advocate for the importance of immunization. So we really need a very good information campaign. There was a suggestion for public announcements, okay? And um, here in CAR, one of the best practices that they were able to share was they disseminated immunization issues, or not immunization issues, but reports on the availability of vaccines through certain groups like the church, the church groups, or it was really done in churches, okay? They disseminated through plazas, okay, that was one suggestion from one group. So penetrate or try to be, ano nga tawag doon? Umaluhokan, town crier, town crier for campaigns and immunization, okay? So there was also a suggestion about mobilizing societies. There was mention of uh, the Philippine Pediatric Society and other non-government organizations. There is also the challenge for you to convince mothers that they are fortunate to have free vaccines, so they should avail of it. So these are some of the solutions that the group uh, suggested. And um, there is strength, and you know that, in private, in both government and non-government partnerships. Dr. Dikusin said for the new vaccines, there should also be supportive supervision. So you have to be very diligent in reporting and that there is a need to tap into encouraging the private doctors, the private pediatricians to report the number of children they have vaccinated. And I think this was one of the sterling solutions that were put forth by Dr. Montaliano and she said, especially for hepatitis B, you should mandate vaccination as a requirement for accreditation of the hospital. Next slide, please. So what were the other issues and strategies that were garnered from that uh, group meeting? There was this problem about vaccines being sold in centers. And Dr. Marrero said that this issue okay, is being addressed. So they call upon the particular person or group. Um, who are not following, I don't, they do not have, uh, they don't put people behind bars, but he says that there is a threat for that person or group in not receiving their retirement pay or retirement benefits, so glad to say that they're not put behind bars, but they are scared enough not to be able to receive their benefits. Next is that one of the things that you could do to encourage 
mothers to have their children vaccinated is that okay, you don't stop at telling them that these are the only vaccines available. I'm sorry, but yes, the government can only afford this, but it's also encouraged that you get vaccines from other sources like your private MDs for the vaccines that are not included in the EPI. Other issues? Next slide, please. I think that's about it. I hope I was able to cover everything from our group and that there would be no questions. So thank you very much. Participating in this workshop, which indeed, uh, as you can see you know, from the outputs, uh, hopefully we're able to come up with all these issues, identify the issues, and identify the, strat the measures and the strategies to strengthen our prevention through vaccination. And so now we will proceed. We are done with our coffee break or just continue for those who are still enjoying uh, your snacks. But we need to proceed to our next session. So allow me. The speaker is a graduate of Doctor of Medicine from the Remedios T. Romualdez Medical Foundation, College of Medicine in Tacloban City, Leyte. She has a Master's in Public Health from the University of the Philippines, Manila, and served as the IMCI National Coordinator at the Department of Health from 1998 to 2002. She is currently a Medical Specialist for and the EPI National Manager of the Department of Health from 2003 up to the present, where she oversees the implementation of the National Immunization Program, develops the National Immunization Plan, and presents it to the Department of Health Executive Committee for approval, as well as develops manuals, guidelines, policies, and standards and other issuances for improving routine immunization, polio eradication, measles elimination, maternal and neonatal tetanus elimination, hepatitis B control, and other childhood vaccine preventable diseases for national implementation, including injection safety. She has served as technical advisor, consultant, facilitator, and coordinator of various training courses on IMCI, immunizations, AEFI and vaccine safety, and has published researches in international journals on measles campaign and on the birth dose of hepatitis B. Ladies and gentlemen, to speak on supplemental immunization activities and the role of vaccines during outbreaks, please welcome Dr. Maria Joyce Ducusi. Good afternoon. So I was tasked to present on the SIA or the Supplemental Immunization Activity and the role of vaccines during outbreaks. So the two key words here are the SIA as well as the outbreaks. So this is the outline of my presentation. First, we'll be on the supplemental immunization activity. It, I will be defining all about the SIA, the purpose, the timing, the duration, the vaccination strategies, the triggers of SIAs, the role of the vaccines during outbreak, and the conclusion. The SIA, or the supplemental immunization activity, is an additional immunization sessions conducted either routine or campaigns. 
Usually in the Philippines, the SIA comes in a campaign mode, either national or sub-national. Our SIAs have country-specific names. So we have the national or the sub-national immunization days. During the 1993, during the then Secretary Juan Flavier, we have the famous national immunization days dubbed as the Oplan Alice disease. We have the Balik Patak contra polio in 2000 when we have the circulating vaccine-derived polio vaccines that were detected. We did also the catch-up immunization for the measles, the, P the Philippine catch-up measles elimination campaign in 1998. This is one of the strategies in the elimination of measles. We did a series of the follow-up immunizations. We did the Ligtastic dust in 2004 and in 2007. We also, and, and the knockout dust in 2007. And the mock-up immunization in 2002 dubbed us the IWAS TIGDAS. So most of our campaigns were for the measles outbreak and as well as in the follow-up for our measles elimination. The, the purpose of our SIAs are to reach the never vaccinated children and to provide an opportunity for a second dose of for cases of primary vaccine failure. For example, is our measles or for the measles containing vaccine. We have recognized that for the measles vaccine, we have a 15% vaccine failure. The timing of our SIAs, it's usually during the seasons of low transmission as determined from the local experience and from review of our epidemiological data. But we take into consideration also factors such as the seasonal accessibility and the important events such as planting, harvesting, religious, traditional, and the political events and even the school openings. This, I would like to show this slide on our confirmed measles cases morbidity month in the Philippines from 2008 to 2012. I want to emphasize here on the timing of our SIAs. We did our MR or the measles rubella SIA in, in April to June of 2011. This is in response to the national measles outbreak. In 2009, we were already detected, detecting outbreaks in some provinces and cities. And based on this report, the best timing to do the supplemental immunization activity is during the low incidence of the cases. In 2009, it should have been between uh, April to June. We issued a memorandum to do the mop-up operations. Some LGUs did as recommended, some did not. Because during that time there was also a low measles coverage, there was already an upsurge of the measles cases. So in 2009, so there was, this was the first peak of our 
measles cases. So we asked the local government units to do an intensive mop-up immunization operations because the funds for the campaign was not yet available. So again, some did good, some did not. So in 2011 was really a national measles outbreak. The duration of the SIAs depends on the following factors. The estimated population to be covered. In the last year campaign, the coverage was nine months up to eight years of age. And the estimated population was 16 million. The second is the type of vaccine to be given. Is it oral or injectable? Oral is easy. We can even train our barangay health workers or other volunteers to do the, the uh, to administer the vaccine. But injectable, it really will really require skills. Then the type of vaccination that will be adopted will it be a door-to-door, fast fix uh, facility, or a mobile uh, vaccination strategy. Then we have also to consider the availability of the logistics, the human resource that has to be considered, and other public health interventions that will be uh, included in the campaigns. Usually, we include the vitamin A supplementation, the deworming, and in some areas, the distribution of treated bed nets for malaria endemic areas. In terms of the number of days, so it can, it can be from few days to weeks or even months. Polio campaigns, it has to be just be completed in a few days. But for measles campaign, it may take over one to two weeks or even months, just like what we had last year. Then for the tetanus toxoid campaigns, so it really would take months because they have to do the campaign in three rounds, zero, then one month, then six months after the second uh, round. So the vaccination strategy. So this is a strategy that is most appropriate for reaching all the children on the basis of a risk area assessment and operational feasibility. So we have these vaccination strategies, the house to house, the fixed sites, and the mobile teams. In the Philippines, our SIAs has always been planned for a house to house or a door to door vaccination. And this has been proven successful. However, the LGUs will determine the most appropriate strategy which can employ all the three types. So what are the types of the vaccination posts? We have the permanent or the fixed immunization post. These are located at permanent health facilities. Immunization will be provided at the health facilities the whole day for the seven days during the campaign or even uh, months. This has also served as a depot for the storage and the distribution of vaccine to temporary fixed sites and the mobile teams. Then we have also the temporary or the fixed immunization post. These are located in schools, churches, bus depot, roadblocks, mar market areas, and even in food chains. Immunization will be provided at these sites for either the duration of the campaign or partially depending on the population density. Then the last type of the vaccination post is the mobile immunization post, wherein the post move from community to community, reaching populations that are living in hard to reach areas who may not have access to fixed sites or too small in size to justify an all-day fixed post or unlikely to visit the fixed sites.
So this mobile team set up an immunization post at a fixed site for a few hours, then moved the post to a new site after completing their task. For the Philippine immunization, so these types of vaccination posts are uh, implemented. So, what are the factors that will trigger the conduct of the SIA? One is if there is an ongoing or a recent polio or measles transmission. Just like in six other provinces right now, after the campaign of the measles, there is still a continuing transmission of the measles virus, so they are doing their localized SIE. The inadequate surveillance, the low routine or the national immunization day coverage. Fourth is the limited access to the health services. Fifth is the hard to reach populations. Sixth is on the dis displaced populations. And the last, if board borders with the endemic zones or countries. So what is the role of the vaccines during outbreak? So let me first define the word outbreak. So outbreak occurs when the number of cases observed is greater than the number normally expected in a given geographical area during the same period of time. The definition of an outbreak will vary according to the country and its phase of control. The example here are the missiles outbreak and the polio outbreak. The Philippines is working towards the measles elimination. Supposed to be this is the year that we target for the elimination, but because the Philippines and the six other countries have not interrupted the circulation of the indigenous measles virus, so the Western Pacific region has changed the target to 2015. And if there is one laboratory confirmed measles case, then it's already considered as an outbreak. And we have been polio free since 2000. If there is one polio case, identified either imported wild for you or still with the indigenous, who knows? It's already considered an emergency case, it's an outbreak, so we must do an SIA. And the countries bordering the Philippines will do or should be alerted so that they can also assess the immunization status and possibly they do also an SIA. This slide would show the impact of our measles rubella vaccinations we did in uh, 2011. So the MR vaccinations have reduced our measles cases dramatically. Looking into this slide, the map of the Philippines, January to December 2011, measles cases, confirmed measles cases, were all over the country. When we say confirmed cases, it can either be clinically confirmed or a laboratory confirmed case or an epidemiologically link measles case. Then the second map of the Philippines will show after the campaign. So where are the measles cases? The measles cases are all still distributed all over the country, but it has reduced and it were concentrate, concentrated in a specific provinces and cities. 
In this slide, it's in region 6, Negros Occidental, Negros Oriental, in the, and then in the Mindanao, and some in the uh, region 4. January to June 2012. So the cases were concentrated only in region 6 as well in region 4A, specifically in Cavite province. May 2012, the cases were found only in Negros Occidental. And June 2012, reduced its number, but still in Negros or, uh, Occidental in Region 6. Okay. So right now, we are monitoring the cases of Negros Occidental because they did a, they, an intensified SIA targeting the children nine months up to 19 years of age because most of their cases were adolescents and adults who were not covered by our immunization program since the 1986 introduction of the measles vaccination. Okay. This slide shows the confirmed measles cases by morbidity month in the national capital region. This slide will show the typical or the classical effect after a SIA has been conducted. So after the SIA was conducted in April to June, so look at the cases after. So it has really reduced. And this is the scenario in the 15 regions of the country. This slide shows the confirmed measles cases in Region 6. This is the opposite of the slide presented earlier. Despite of the measles rubella campaign that was done, measles cases still was very high. So what was wrong? Was it because the vaccine was not effective? Or was it on the implementation of the immunization in that particular province? The cases are adolescents and some adults, but there are also cases below the eight years old who have or should have received at least one dose of the measles vaccine either during the routine immunization at nine months or 12 months or during the campaign. When we started with our laboratory confirmation of the measles case, it also started the laboratory confirmation of the rubella cases. Any suspect measles case, a blood sample has to be submitted for the isolate or for the determination of the IgM, the bodies. And if it turns negative, then automatically this will be subjected to rubella testing. So we were already having rubella cases from 2008 to 2011 as presented. When we did the MR vaccination, it also controlled our rubella cases. And this is the one also that we are monitoring. Who knows? With the, with the measles elimination, we can also eliminate rubella in the country. And the MRSIA, we were able to eliminate 
the G3 measles virus serotype. The, the G3 was isolated in 2011, and this has been known as the imported measles uh, virus serotype. The D9 is the indigenous measles virus that is still circulating in the country. And this is the one that we want to get rid before uh, 2015. And we can also only do this if we have to improve our immunization, routine immunization, giving the measles vaccine at nine months, and the second dose in the as MMR at 12 to 15 months. So, okay. so those three previous slides would show us the impact of our MR SIA in 2011. But the challenge remains because the D9 is still circulating in a few provinces in the country. And this is the one that we are doing an intensified monitoring and we always ask them to do their uh, catch-up immunizations. I just want to share with you this slide because recently the Philippines has been assessed as high risk for polio importations. China had a polio outbreak, an importation of the wild polio virus coming from Pakistan. We determined that the frequency or the travels from this particular province in China to the Philippines, and we knew that it was very low. Okay? But if ever, we had those importations of the wild polio virus, then we will adopt this strategy of China. They first did or use the trivalent OPV because there is that immediate need to control first of the cases. Because the TOPV was available, so it has to be given immediately after assessment. Surveillance continue, then the isolation of the virus, and if there is a specific polio type that will be isolated, then it will shift the immunization or the type of vaccines that will be used from the T OPV to either the bivalent OPV or the monovalent OPV depending on the isolate. For China, so they did the TOPV and the MOPV, but look at the number of rounds. They did the five rounds because they were not able to control the uh, outbreak. So, OPV shall, will always be the vaccine of choice for the Philippines until the polio eradication. For the conclusion, SIA is conducted to reach more eligible population and increase the immunization coverage. Second, SIAs will always be conducted even with a 95% immunization coverage. This is because there, is, there are vaccine failures that has been recognized. The third, SIA should be well planned and well funded. The third, vaccines chosen for SIA shall provide the maximum efficacy and shall target at least one to three diseases. An example of this is the measles rubella vaccine that we have used it during our 2011 campaign. And lastly, a quality SIA is required to entrap 
the, trans the circulation of the specific virus and or prevent the disease outbreak. But we cannot do the SIA so often. The MRSIA that we had in 2011, the government spent more than 600 million pesos just to reach the 16 million children. But if we improve our immunization coverage, reaching all the infants and children with the two-dose missiles, it will only cost us around 200 million pesos to reach the birth cohort of 2.5 million a year. So we have to consider SIA or routine to prevent outbreak of any vaccine preventable diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ducusi. May I now call on Dr. Montegliano and Dr. Fabai to present our Certificate of Appreciation.